Is the car market or the high-end car market crashing? We see videos on TikTok all the time. You see lots of things on TikTok. How to be a real estate bro, a crypto <laughs> bro, you know. There's lots of bros happening. Exotic car hacks. Bro. Stuff like that. Um, but you also see real inflammatory headlines and short videos about you know, repo lots and stuff like that. And is the car market really crashing? And then you go on bring a trailer or everybody's favorite online auction website and you see one or two bad results and you see people uh, opining that, oh, the market's crashing because of this one data point. And this is something we've talked about before, but I think it warrants talking about again. And in particular, because just a couple weeks ago, Broad Arrow Auctions, which is a subsidiary of Haggerty, has uh, launched their inaugural auction at the Chattanooga Motor Car Festival, which is a growing and uh, popular event down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I will say it looks like something we might need to start going to because we had a couple of friends there and it looked awesome. I've heard it is a great event. Yes. So, of course, you have the... the uh, the panache of a big name auction and uh, associated with the event that helps to grow it. But a first outing is always a little bit of a risk. They had some good cars. They had some mediocre cars, just like any other auction. So we wanted to unpack that a little bit and compare it against some bring a trailer statistics and anecdotes and see if we can glean anything useful from that to make better decisions buying and selling and maybe put to bed the uh, myth or not myth of is the exotic car market crashing for this month anyway. And then we'll be back next month because it'll be a <laughs> could, hot topic. Could change next week. Yes. Yes. So they had uh, 91 vehicles at this auction, smaller, a little bit more curated auction, not the thousands of cars that go through Barrett Jackson. And their sell through rate was 73%, which seems a little bit low, but that's not counting deals made after the fact. So their published sell through rate as of today was 82%. So that included deals that closed. Um, not, you know, not at the hammer, but post auction. How does this compare to like, uh, we've been going to Amelia for the past few years and things seem pretty successful there when you're in the room, which is part of the smoke and mirrors, I imagine. But sure. is that relatively normal? Yep. 82% is kind of right on the money. Um, there's some auctions that boast into the 90s, but that's uh, typically a, a one-off or maybe an extra successful auction. Barrett-Jackson, of course, is 100% sell-through rate because they require everything to be no reserve. And there's an interesting dichotomy that people, when analyzing this, will look at. They'll look at the sell-through rate of reserve cars and compare those metrics against each other because they say, well, no reserve cars don't count because they're all selling. I don't know that I like that comparison. Um, I think you got to look at the numbers themselves because over time, those sell-through rates have stayed generally the same across all of the auction platforms and have not varied significantly. Uh, I think the auction houses themselves are fairly up on what the market is doing. So they're going to require a reserve to be set in line with current market conditions. So a sell through or non sell through rate is not necessarily directly indicative of what the market is doing up or down. The metric that I found interesting was the percentage of cars that did not even reach the low estimate. Yes, that was something that stood out to me almost immediately. You said, hey, check this out. Look at all these cars. I'm flicking through. There's some interesting cars in there. There's ones that I'd, I think I'd like to call out. But like that was what drew my attention immediately. Yep. And side note, uh, this is a quip from our friend, John Sabo, he was making fun of the big auction houses, I think we all do, for their ginormous estimates, right? The, the range is, if we we're in physics class or something, they'd never allow this margin of error. We'd get an F on our paper. You know, it's this, this car is estimated between 250 and 350,000. 
Well, no kidding. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's, I think the weathermen are even jealous of the <laughs> bandwidth that they give themselves or the, the margin of error. Like, it's insanity. Oh, 1.5 to 2.2 million. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I have to be way better at my job than that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, uh, I, I understand that uh, the bidding can go very well or not well at all, depending on conditions, but at least give us a, a more accurate idea of what you really think the car is going to sell for under normal conditions. However, 73% of cars, whether they sold or did not sell, did not bid to the low estimate. Oof. 73%. 8% of cars hammered at the low estimate. So add those two together, 81% of cars were at or below the low estimate. Now, typically in an auction, you want to have kind of like a box and whisker plot, right? So you have a majority of cars selling in between the low and the high. You have outliers on both sides. You have some selling way above the high and some selling below the low and those kind of all offset. And, you know, you have a nice bell curve in a sense for sure while well, this was a reverse hockey stick if you put it on a graph so that spoke to me in terms of ooh, this is a bit concerning <laughs> or well again we have to look at it one it was their first year it was a first year auction so they may not have had the audience that they wanted it's mm -hmm. not an established sale that can impact things although with virtual bidding, online bidding, right? Everybody in their bidder list gets the catalog. Anybody can bid from anywhere. Um, but I want to highlight a few things within the auction itself um, and kind of take a look at, you know, certain segments that may have been impacted more or less. Something I would like to call out is there was an S2000 in this auction. I don't know if this is the first time that an S2000 has been in a big wig, hoity toity kind of auction, but I got depressed. <laughs> it is an S2000. They're fantastic. They're wonderful. But at an auction? I think I've seen a delivery mile S2000 CR at one of the auctions. That, I will not, allow that. Not this a regular one. Relatively normal. I think it was hyper low mileage, but like, boh, this is, this is when I start to feel old. Yes. Uh, dear listeners. So let's, let's call out a few of them. So there was a 2023 Z06 convertible with a high sticker price. I think it was 155 sticker, 200 miles, and it bid to 125. That's 30 grand below sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Rewind to our discussion a couple weeks ago, specifically about the Z06 market and the person who wanted, thought we were way off by bidding 35K below sticker. Well, this was a retail high-end auction sale and it didn't sell at 30 below. Uh, I think this guy should have taken the 125 bid because it is not getting better from there. It is not. They are going down in value. He's hanging on to a sinking ship. Yes. Uh, another standout was a 2015 Aston Martin DB9 Coupe. I think this was, this is the depreciation special of this year. Uh, the estimate was 65 to 85. It sold for 47.5. Now we're talking about hammer price here. We're using the hammer price app. We're not talking about what you see published on the auction website, which includes the buyer's fees. We're talking the actual hammer bid, uh, because I think that's more accurate because that's halfway in between what the seller nets and what the buyer pays. Um, that car, so it sold for 47.5. That car sold earlier this year, I believe it was, man, there's, there's a bunch of transactions. It's, it's made its rounds. 2018, it was listed for 115. 2021, it was listed for 100. 2022, it was listed for 96K. January of 2023, it was listed for $90,000. March of 2024, it was listed again for 74.5. So this thing just keeps going down in value. But whoever bought it earlier this year probably paid around 70 grand and net about $42,000. <laughs> so they almost cut that in half. Oh, brutal. Uh, used exotic cars are not good investments. 
I w- every time something like this happens, I just hope in my soul that this is when we start realizing that these things are not investments, but I know it's not going to, this is just a blip. Uh, 1996 Bentley Azure with 9,200 miles in racing green over tan. Oh. Estimate was 50 to 70 K sold for 32 five. Oh. If that car was clean, that was the score of the auction. Man. Uh, I wanted to point out, as well, the kind of standouts, the newer Porsches, right? Didn't we talk about new GT3 RSs being the ones to, to yep. maybe be the next bubble? So all of the newer, quote unquote, modern collectible Porsches, all were below the low estimate. I also didn't realize that the uh, 991 uh, GT2 RSs were so much money. Yep. That's not a market I really pay attention to. I don't roll in that kind of cash. But whoa. But even then, significantly below the lowest. Correct. 911 Dakar, 2018, 991 GT2 RS, 2019 Porsche Speedster, and a 2023 GT3 RS Tribute Edition, all below the low estimate but the older porsches there's a couple of like 80s 911s there's a turbo look cab there's a turbo cab but like all of those did pretty well yep including this ridiculous 996 i I think the listeners are going to think i only pay attention to 996s (laughs) but this is so crazy it is a carrera 4 that was done up by gimbala is that how you pronounce it gimbala sure uh it's gray uve Eye searing red interior. It's the narrow body Carrera 4 that they sort of made look like a turbo and then put a turbo engine in. Somebody paid over a hundred grand for this for a 996. Yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. not a GT. There was also a 2011 Audi R8 manual B10 coupe in red, 7,100 miles. That should be a 150K car. The estimate was 120 to 140, a high bid to 105. I think this is a good uh, picture. You could look at that and say the R8 market is crashing, but if you look at actual recent transactions, that is way out of bounds and not indicative of the R8 market. And if you look up that car itself, it has a little bit of a sketchy history. So it's not a primo example. And I think some people were uh, nervous of the car because of that. So that's just one example of how you can't take an individual transaction and and apply it to the overall market in general. But yeah, there was a lot of deals there. What about that purple 6.0? Yeah, there was a Viola Ophelia. I was Ophelia in it. Yeah, so I, good. I would love to get rid of my orange one for a purple one. Um, that one high bid to five hundred forty thousand dollars, and it sold after the auction for an undisclosed sum. Look, I think orange is one of the peak colors for a six zero, but this purple is something else. Here's the fun part of it. So they did not disclose what it sold for, but on Broad Arrow's website, they listed the sales from high to low dollar mm. amount. And the one above the Diablo sold for five ninety three, dollars inclusive of buyer's premium, which is, I believe, 10% above two hundred fifty dollars So you're looking at about $50,000. So if it sold with the buyer's premium for less than that, arguably, it would have either had to have sold for the high bid or for less than the high bid. That is, whoa, yeah. That's why. Because if it's a 10% buyer's premium, that would be $54,000. That would put it above $593,000. So huh. someone I know had the theory that it got bid up artificially and then they sold it to the underbidder for less ah. than the high bid. Again, that's just speculation, but it's certainly interesting that at high bid to 540 and then, you know, sold for maybe less than the high bid. Eh, Interesting. These things can happen. We don't always know why, but they can happen. I think in summary, though, it does seem like there continues to be some level of cooling on the on the broad, broad strokes after broad arrow. <laughs> it's not significant. Yeah, I get it. You know, it's not like things are crashing. Crashing is bold, but there's does seem to things are not, you know, gangbusters every auction. Sure. The other point I want to make is Whenever we talk about this, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that people offer. And the most common one is, oh my gosh, look at all the 
reserve not met on bring a trailer because that's kind of a spectator sport. Everybody can watch. The problem is we now have, or bring a trailer now has, I don't know why I said we, we as the audience (laughs) now have over a hundred auctions per day to watch on bring a trailer. So if you look at their actual stats, their sell through rate is not changing, but because they are, have so many more auctions, there's going to be more reserve not met as well. The statistics show that there aren't any more on a percentage wise that are not meeting reserve. So that that's not a valid observation from an anecdotal perspective, but in general, I think, honestly, I think the market needs to cool, right? So hundred percent anecdotally and, and, I think this is true on the super, super high end, right? All the bajillion million dollar cars are getting out of control. I feel like that market's saturated. I might be wrong. There's 23 or 21 million millionaires in the U.S. Like, that's a lot. There's a lot of money to go around. But I got offered a roof CTR, which is the yellow bird. It wasn't the yellow bird, but that's what we're talking about here. For four and a half million dollars... Uh, what that is a glorified g body 911 yeah i am way oversimplifying it and probably going to offend some people i I love roofs i love 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 they're my favorite ah, i shouldn't say tuner but they're 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 not what's yeah they're They're like like a coach builder but they also coach build the engines yes (laughs) and they have their own bins and they are a manufacturer but but you look at it and it's it's 911 right it is a 911 they're rare. They have an incredible history. I get it. But take a step back. Take take some of that out of it and go, I could have a Ferrari F50 or a 911. I Ooh. am but I am probably really close to being a Porsche fanboy if I'm not already, and I'd still take the Ferrari. <laughs> My goodness. I have a fake roof <laughs> over here that's cost me like a hundred grand. So anyway, wildly different. uh, Yeah. It's tribute. It's a (laughs) tribute. It's yes. Anyway, um, that brings us to our wall of shame of the week, which we're revising a little bit. So we get a lot of, uh, mean comments. Well, uh, most of them are directed at me. (laughs) Uh, Thank God. Yes. Um, and they come in, in all shapes and sizes, some of them in uh, good humor, some of them not, so we thought we would address them in the, the style of mean tweets, right? So we'll read our own mean comments and respond to them. And since it's the mean tweet of the week, I thought I'd just sort, shorten it and call it the mean tweak. So we're going uh, we're gonna to bring in a mean tweak. This was on my ever and continuingly controversial transporter fail video where, where I called out a bad transporter and made fun of him. And boy, have I gotten a lot of flack for that one. So Ethan, what do we got off of that video? Grow up. You sound like a two year old complaining. The car is going to get there just fine. Ah, uh, yes. <sighs> the you're a childish Karen. Uh, yes. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. If you use a bad transporter, the car may get there just fine. Uh, but As I've said before, and I'll say it again, a man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an opinion. So there's a lot of people on the internet with an opinion about it. And ironically, somebody posted on the same video very shortly after that, that they were quoted $600 to ship a car and they paid the broker up front. The car arrived late, which uh, that's, goes without saying. Standard. <laughs> then the driver <laughs> demanded twelve hundred dollars to unload the car. Who? Right. Ooh. Probably because the broker never paid the driver itself, so it may not have even been a driver trying to like scam him or both. I don't know, but you know, okay, that's a real experience. That's something that happened to somebody versus these people that just go off on the internet and say that I'm an idiot because I complain about people screwing other people over and being terrible at their job. But still, it's like we've talked about so many times with these transporters, like especially if you're transporting some high-end exotic car, some sports car, is it worth saving a thousand dollars? To uh, I mean, yes, a thousand, but we're well, talking like one or two hundred. But is even what that's even like, saving. Ugh, but you want to make sure your car gets there, and it's yes. like how how much risk is it? Is it worth it? Probably not. Yes. 
Nuts for Sticks is a brand celebrating the manual transmission in all its forms. So forget those flappy paddles because we like shifting ourselves. Check out our fun and funny stick themed shirts at nutsforsticks.com and save 10% on your order using the discount code SWITCHCAST. That's nutsforsticks.com and use code SWITCHCAST. Thank you for joining us for SwitchCast with Doug Tabbitt and Tyler Sanders, produced by Ethan Huffnagel. SwitchCast is an automotive entertainment and opinion show, and nothing we say should be taken very seriously. We do not give tax, investment, legal, emotional, or professional advice, and the only licenses we hold are driver's licenses. The opinions expressed on this show are exclusively held by the people pontificating at that moment and do not reflect the values of our producers or sponsors. Our theme music is provided by Emily and Ivory. You can stream their full album on Spotify or SoundCloud. If you like this show, you can stream it in its entirety on your favorite audio podcast platform. Check out switchcast.live for more info.